we're going to talk about designing games for mobile devices. The nuances of platform controls and layouts, and specifically with Chris Tayo. Uh, gaming on mobile is here to stay as we move forward with increased accessibility, stronger devices, <coughs> and an increasing emphasis on portability through the resurgence of handheld gaming. It is important to keep in mind me. some of the nuances in designing experiences, especially for mobile platforms. Our speaker today, <laughs> our speaker for today is Christopher Tayo. Tofi is a senior UX design lead at Secret Six, known for his strong affinity for crafting excuse me, intuitive workflows and user-centric experiences. Before specializing in UX research and analysis, Tofi has excuse me, built a strong understanding of game development in over six years as a producer and digital marketing manager. Currently, Tofi plays a pivotal role in shaping the user experiences of the company's projects and nurturing and training the design team. So, can you virtually chat, uh, clap for Chris and uh, Tayao as he, he he shares his knowledge about uh, design and design game design. Thank you. Take it away, Chris. Hello. Okay. So, first off, I'd like to say. Uh, good afternoon to everyone and thank you to UXPH for inviting me to share this little talk with you guys. Uh, it's great to be here and I'm happy to share a little bit about how we at Secret6 uh, go about designing games specifically for the mobile platform. Uh, just a really quick introduction. Uh, first off, thank you uh, so much for that uh, spirited introduction. Uh, it's okay. Uh, it's it's so easy to get sick nowadays. Uh, hopefully your cough uh, gets a little bit better in the future. Um, so my name is Christopher Tayao. Uh, I'm the senior UX design lead for Secret 6 game design department. Uh, I started off as a producer many, many, many years ago before moving into marketing and learning more about the importance of identifying target markets and eventually the importance of user psychology. And from this, my interest in user experience grew as there was a very clear overlap between identifying target markets and defining users. After a while and a little bit of self-study and exposure, I found myself uh, as the uh, foundation or the footing in UX design. Uh, and that happened all within uh, Secret 6. Speaking of Secret 6, a really quick introduction lang. Uh, we've been co-developing AAA titles since 2005, providing extraordinary worlds through well-imagined 3D and 2D art. Stunning visual, um, stunning visual effects and exceptional game development uh, that are carefully designed to win the hearts and respect of gamers with impeccable tastes. Through the years, the world's top game development studios have tapped on our obsession with craft, transforming us from being just the new kids on the block to now an industry benchmark. And that being said, let's go over to the coverage of the talk. So gaming on mobile, as mentioned earlier, is really here to stay as we move forward with really strong devices. And if you notice with ASUS, uh, the Steam Deck, the Switch, uh, 3DS that started it all, um, Mobile gaming really is here to stay and it's transitioning more and more into people's hands uh, by the nature of the machines themselves getting stronger and our phones getting uh, a lot better. So I hope to be able to share a little bit about the mobile gaming market. So in, in, or in order to identify what game design you want to make or what game you want to push out there, it's very important that you have an idea of what, uh, who you're selling to, right? Uh, next is I want to be able to highlight some of the challenges of designing for mobile and eventually share some good practices that hopefully can help you guys not just in game development uh, or game design but also even in like website or app development. So let's get right on it. Regardless of platform, uh, people will always play games for different reasons and it's very easy to condense players into these two camps, right? Uh, casual and hardcore, especially for the mobile space. But that is a super over oversimplification. Uh, and most players usually lie somewhere in the middle. So especially for today where mobile games are increasing in complexity and focusing more on player engagement and retention, the line between hardcore and casual is really blurring. And that is where in the industry today we are calling it the uh, hybrid casual design. So what is hybrid casual? While the concept of hybrid casual itself isn't new. 
it's been recently spotlighted just this year actually and it's uh, fi it's finally been given a name right it mixes the simple controls and concepts of hyper casual games with the mid core progression elements so a good example of these are tap titans empire and puzzles and archero uh, hybrid casual games attract a wide variety of gamers while being able to design the appropriate experiences for them is essential and that's where uh, archetypes come in archetypes is a very unique tool uh, from a ux game design standpoint because they help a lot in order to identify the intended user experience that we want to provide we start off by identifying what kind of player you're trying to motivate with your game's design and with the help of player archetypes or player models in in quotation marks you can easily see the aspects of the game that you can focus on. And these player models really help in identifying the kinds of players that you want your game to favor and focus on so that you can create a more uh, accurate persona. So as seen on screen, these are three of the more uh, basic types that we like to use in Secret 6. The Bartle Taxonomy of Player Types, the Four Keys of Fun, and Game Refineries Player Archetypes. Each of this, these segments really have their own uh, explanations and uh, derive their um, statistics and information from actual uh, analysis and research. So I will leave this a little bit here so you guys can take notes and if ever, uh, it's just a quick Google search away. Another tip uh, for designing experiences for mobile is to capitalize really on what the mobile platform is very good at and letting your game design emphasize those features. The UI would then follow these aspects and you can really focus on designing around them. So the first one is immedi immediacy, which means your game really needs to be optimized so that you can minimize players' downtime while waiting for things to load or things to process. We are a far cry from the old times where your, your laptop comes with 2 gigabytes of RAM, your mobile phone's highlighting feature is 256 MB of RAM, right? We're, we're way far beyond that. And with that speed up in reaction and in feedback, players really expect things to load really fast and to for games and for interfaces to really give feedback to you as snappily as possible. So you should always direct your player to what they need to accomplish right away and consistently so that they we reduce the time that it, it would need for them to think so it really also applies to games right and just not just in the ui and the feedback but also in the game designs that we do and more specifically the onboarding that goes with that burst sessions mean designing around experiences that last for a maximum of 30 to 45 minutes at a time uh, mobile games excel at this uh, long gaming sessions on mobile do occur, uh, but it's really much more common for people to go in, play one or two sessions, do their dailies, and then like peace out after. Um, and lastly, the habitual design means designing experiences that are habit-forming. These are often represented in daily login schemes or... Um, giving you daily quests that refresh after 24 hours or at a certain server timing. Uh, this creates a really strong habit of opening the app and making it part of their daily lives. And that becomes a really strong uh, driving force why a lot of these mobile games really have these kinds of aspects. It really goes up in retention. So to sum up the really the really the first part of that talk uh so people that play mobile games are no longer really just casual gamers in air quotes there are a wide range of people that play games on their phones and being able to identify who these people are and what about your game specifically would motivate them is the ideal when you're generating your personas uh similarly uh I, being able to identify the strong aspects of your game design and how the mobile platform can capitalize on them and allowing the game to shine through being on mobile uh, will really strengthen your game's experiences and make it as unique as possible and make it stand out from the crowd. So on to the, a little bit more of the specifics of the talk. So let's start with a little bit of designing uh, the challenges that you might face or can face while designing for mobile. 
these are the things that you want to keep in mind uh, when you start working on a mobile game and really they apply from anywhere from building a game from scratch to when you're porting a game into mobile so first off of course you know, uh, the most common one is screen size uh, it might really be common knowledge but the limited screen size of mobile devices is a very real and impactful challenge. It's usually the first thing that UI UX designers really focus on when designing on mobile, which means you have this tendency to uh, prioritize minimalist and clean looking designs. But we can actually also design the content itself by shortening microcopy and making sure that the messaging is concise enough to complement the allocation of larger font sizes. Another aspect of design that should be taken advantage of is progressive disclosure of information and only really showing the user UI elements when they are of utmost importance. So this includes uh, contextual controls, utilizing submenus, and planning out your informational hierarchy at the beginning of your project. One of the aspects that are often overlooked uh, is really providing larger touch points. So touch points are basically the interactable area of a UI element or a button that you see on screen. And we often want larger touch points compared to the visual uh, to make it a lot easier for the user to tap on. So on screen right now are some of the examples of the sizing uh, that we use internally. So if you can see the image while being maybe 48 by 48 pixels, the pink area that you're seeing is actually going to be the full touch point area um, and this applies across the board regardless of, regardless of the size of the button so the next challenge when designing for mobile is figuring out interactions this is usually observed when porting games into mobile so from let's say you're 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 moving uh, a, an, an old game from uh, the pc is being ported into mobile into the mobile space or a game from uh, console uh, is being uh, ported into the mobile space uh, this is usually uh, it it's interactions as something that we want to consider when we're designing something that's supposed to be cross-platform and here are some of the examples of exclusive and common mobile interactions so if you notice it's something that comes as an afterthought often enough when I'm talking to other designers when you're porting something on mobile, you lose the interaction of hovering over or right-clicking on something. We're so used to just hovering over something, especially on when you're playing PC games, right? You hover over a, a button and a contextual little menu shows up or a contextual uh, tooltip shows up that tells you what that button is about. When you're on mobile, you lose that ability. Um, you have specific... Uh, you have some interactions that are cross-compatible. Uh, so tapping or clicking, uh, clicking, pressing and dragging, uh, and of course the long press or holding. Uh, so when you're designing something to be cross-platform, you want to take advantage of the middle section of this uh, visual. And when you're designing something specifically for mobile, or if you want your game to be as mobile native as possible, you want to take advantage also of the mobile interactions like double tapping, swiping, or shaking the device and tilting. Right. Uh, and here are some common gestures uh, that you can utilize specifically for mobile. So these are things that you really can't rep 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 replicate on other consoles or other or, or on other platforms. Right. You don't have you have two analogs, but they don't serve to be your two fingers when you're playing a console game. Right. So it's really just uniquely mobile to have these interactions. So if you want your game to stand out as being really mobile native, uh, you want to make the most out of the mobile-only interactions. Next is the thumb and finger zone. Uh, mobile has a unique challenge of different grips depending on the player and the game that they're playing. Uh, we want to be able to utilize a finger or thumb grip zone or heat map uh, is a good way to determine the size and position of different UI elements in your game depending on what you're doing or what you're trying to accomplish. So as you can see on screen, we have several um, guides that we often use internally uh, to identify, okay, so if the user is, is playing a game and requires both of their hands on landscape, these are the areas or, or uh, this, this is the heat map that we can use. And we want to put like the more less used elements or less used uh, UI interactions uh, like up on top on the yellow or on the red zones. Meanwhile, we want the more um, commonly used 
uh, over at the uh, green areas and this changes from device to device from game to game like some games would play in landscape some games would play in portrait and really that's uh, a unique challenge for designing games on mobile and of course i mentioned grips earlier the typical grips are as follows uh, some people play games one-handedly other people play with one hand holding the phone and the other interacting the elements on screen uh, and some people use both hands to tap on the screen uh, players usually change between these grips from time to time depending on uh, how long their gaming session is what they're trying to accomplish or what they're currently doing so it's very important to identify and highlight really uh, the heat map so that you know where and how to be able to position your ui elements so moving on to some of the best practices of designing games for mobile we'll be going through the following uh, first off, we'll be defining and understanding the purpose of a screen, uh, developing effective typography, and testing for localization. Like I'll give you a little uh, uh, hint for localization part because that's one of the aspects that, again, come as an afterthought for a lot of designers. Uh, and lastly, to develop your own standard visual library before creating wireframes or prototypes. So before we move on to the first item, uh, if ever you guys have any questions, just feel free to uh, write it up. Um, I know that the talk is a little bit uh, on the fast side, uh, but there's really a lot of information here uh, to learn. So moving on to the first one, uh, defining really the define and understand the purpose of the screen. So we want to be able to speed up the process of designing wireframes. And by defining and understanding the purpose of each screen that you're designing, it you will constantly be guided and reminded of the goal of that screen and what requirements that you need for the player to accomplish what they want to do. So to do this, simply start by creating an information hierarchy. Uh, I, I mentioned this earlier as well. And you create an information hierarchy by identifying the elements and information that's absolutely necessary to be uh, visible during the screen and what it's for and what the elements visual should be so on screen right now is a really quick example of how we like to organize things uh, so screen is on the leftmost followed by uh, certain information and details uh, on the middle and then notes on the right and this is actually commonly shared across our game development team so that everyone's on the same page <clears throat> this really will help you get a clear idea of what you need and what you and what you need, why you need that thing and why. So to help with this, uh, you can start by practicing a little bit of red routing. Uh, this is the act of mapping out your screens and determining how many people will be using which screen at which time and how often. Red routes are often uh, have often helped us at the start of projects to figure out which screens will need the most attention and which helps with uh, really task prioritization and planning at the very beginning uh, Will the slides be available after the talk? Uh, I can make it available. I'll be talking to the uh, UXPH afterwards All right uh, next up is Another way to highlight the purpose of the screen is for users to Keep UI is for you to keep your UI elements simple and really very visual Um a very good example of this is using a burning rope uh, of how Hearthstone uses a burning rope to inform about time limits instead of putting actual numbers on screen. By keeping visual elements in simple and animated forms, you not only catch the player's eyes, but you are also able to uh, communicate very clearly on screen what the purpose of that element is without having to increase the mental load on them. Like you, you don't need to show, instead of like Hearthstone in, in this example, instead of showing you a timer that starts from the very start of the turn up until the very end that counts down, they just show this at the very last few seconds uh, of, the, of your turn so that you know when it's time to speed up your pace, right? And lastly, with the previous concepts in mind, you can start creating a structured interface that passively sections information off into groups. And this will allow you to be able to help your players focus better. Second little thing is to develop effective typography and to test for localization. Uh, second best practice I'd like to share 
Uh, this will ensure that your copy is legible and clear on pretty much any device. Uh, a good example of this is Netflix uses something called Sudolock. Uh, it's their own font and testing methodology to be able to determine copy length and styling without having to wait for per language translations. So this is what it looks like. <clears throat> right. Uh, pseudo localization is a way to simulate translations of English UI strings without having to wait for and go through the real effort of translating. Uh, if you this is something that they developed a, a, a really long time ago and that they still use today uh, so that things remain readable for the developer or for the engineer or for the designer without um, with already taking into account how to block text uh, frames, uh, how to position or what font size should be used for certain uh, sections, uh, and of course, in how long or how many characters should a certain section uh, retain. Think of it as a fake translation that remains readable to an English native speaker, uh, but it still allows them really to test for translation related to expanding and um, knowing how many or what the information needs to be there. So if you do a quick Google search, it should be, you, you would actually be able to find a quote unquote translator online that you can put in your text and it'll spit it out in Sudolock and you can copy paste that onto your um, content. So you can stop using lorem ipsum. <laughs> Uh, and lastly, we want to be able to optimize the number of characters per line when writing copy. So this is something that's actually often overlooked. Um, a lot of UX designers tend to lean on the very informative, very straightforward copy. But game designers usually like very eloquent, very fluffy words. So on the UX level, we want to be able to already identify with them how many characters per line they need to stop at before things become start becoming difficult to read. And really the ideal is around 30 to 40 characters per line. So that includes the spaces. The third best practice that I'd like to share is to develop your own visual library. Uh, otherwise known as a UI toolkit, uh, it's a library of components, styles, and styles on Figma that you can use throughout the wireframing process. The idea behind it is to have a set of UI elements that you can easily use across multiple wireframes and that are all interconnected to that uh, UI kit so that when you edit one, it edits everything at the same time. So it's usually done in Figma uh, with components, variants, and styles. And really creating your own internal visual library per project can help keep an entire team on the same page when they view your wireframes and allow you to create faster layout iterations. Figma has several of these uh, and should easily be accessible to serve as your foundation. And then you can just customize it for your needs. Um, and then we'll move on to a little bit of the pitfalls of designing for mobile UX design. So uh, we don't want to. Uh, so first off, uh, it's we don't want to um, force too many elements on screen because just because everything is important. Uh, we also don't want to be just blindly reusing icons and we also don't want to over polish frames. So we'll go into each one in depth. During the initial process of wireframing a screen, there's a tendency to fill the screen with all of the elements we think the user would need. Uh, this is specifically very evident in some of the more janky, um, hastily ported games or, or games that are just made. Uh, yes, use design systems is very, very accurate. Um, However, it's not really always necessary to display every possible button or detail on the screen. So this is where you can refer to your red routes and screen objectives to be able to determine really what information is required. Uh, so according to Hicks law, the time it takes to make a decision increases with the number and complexity of the choices. It's best to reduce the number of things on screen and prevent players from feeling overwhelmed. And by minimizing the choices to interact with on screen, you can really help reduce the time required for the player to make a very strong decision. A typical ex uh, example of this in games are called quick time events, wherein every other element of the UI is pushed out and the only the thing that you need to focus on is shown on screen. Notice how there's really nothing else there, uh, not even the player's HP bar, right? So that the player can really focus on the action that's taking place uh, and at the same time what the, the player needs to do at that immediate time. 
Next up is blindly reusing elements from other platforms like PC or console. Uh, it's really sometimes it makes sense to bring over the exact same UI, especially if the thing that you're porting or the thing that you're recreating onto your mobile uh, game already was designed for mobile in mind. So for instance, uh, perhaps just a simple font font change is the only thing needed to make uh, reading make something readable. Uh, but when you go into games and with the more complex uh, with the more complex uh, interactions that you see with games, it becomes more and more difficult. So according to the Nielsen Norman group, simply porting the UI de UI of one from one device to another will just lead to a subpar user experience for one, if not both of the platforms because of how different the sizing and capabilities are and because of how the player interacts with these devices differently. So more often than not, simply using the same design will not work. This is where we found, we, we started or we, we wanted to push the idea that when we're porting a game or when we're remastering a game for mobile, we want to make it mobile native, uh, like from the very ground level up until the very um, end of the project. It's as if the game was really made to be on mobile. So the words of uh, wisdom here is to be able to remain open to redesigning interfaces and really prioritize mobile native behaviors as much as possible. So this is something that you can you can use as a as your um, reasoning behind why your estimates for a particular screen might be longer than others right like when you're when your boss is going why why is we're just trying to get the website on the mo on, on a mobile device why is it going to take you two times as long so that's where you can really go back understand the source material and understand the mobile space and go we have to make it mobile native so Mihoyo is actually very uh, is a, actually a very good example of good cross-platform UI UX. So the PC version on your uh, left is uh, it'll always provide callouts on screen to make it very easy to recognize what you need to press to do certain actions. Meanwhile, on the other side, uh, mobile versions tend to be very clear of these callouts. That there's no uh, the you don't have that same. Uh, button call out uh, because you're supposed to be able to tap on the icons themselves. So this consideration even extends to consoles and controller support and the gameplay even compensates for your input method. When you are selecting targets while using a certain ultimate, the game actually pauses so that you have the time and the uh, agency to select targets which is not um, present actually when you're playing on a mobile device or without a controller so it takes into account the 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 in the player's input method to be able to provide a very usable experience so last one is uh, you might have this tendency to over polish your wireframes uh, visual adding visual flair and a lot of different colors can really add distractions to your wireframes and too early in the process if you polish too hard uh, these might add unnecessary scrutiny or even confusion when you're having your wireframes checked or tested you might also make the mistake of focusing more on making it look good instead of making it usable and readable so what you can do is to use simple monochromatic wireframes to see the layout better, iterate faster, and receive faster feedback. Remember that wireframes are meant to be low fidelity. Meanwhile, mockups are the ones that are higher fidelity. So knowing when to use which is very important when you are trying to design for games. All right. So let's do a quick recap of the overall talk. Uh, First off, identify your target market, generate accurate personas that consider motivation over demographic. So this is something that's unique to uh, games when you're designing for games. Um, a lot of the time when we ask designers to give us a target market, they generate age. Um, they, they generate age, they generate uh, the sex, they generate the... Um, location and then they tell us like um, 
what devices they use. While these are very generic and can be useful, when you're designing for games, what's more important is why they play games, what games they play, how long do they play these games, and what about these games really excite them. Because when you are able to identify these more core quote unquote gamer elements of a persona uh, you can really get a better focus on what your game design can be and what your UI UX will need to convey so that's where archetypes that we mentioned earlier will come in when necessary it will really help you guide it will really help guide you to identify okay so these kinds of players really enjoy uh, strategy games because they like the feeling of being able to uh, dominate over other people. Meanwhile, this other sub um, unit of people prefer to use uh, prefer strategy games because they just like the idea of building something or creating uh, um, amassing an army. Uh, and other people might gravitate towards the exact same game just because they like the art, right? So understand the motivations of your demographic. Uh, use ar archetypes when necessary. So next one is to understand the strengths of the mobile platform. It's no longer for casual gamers. Um, identify the weaknesses of the platform, design around them, and utilize its strengths. The habitual gaming in bursts is a very big deal. Um, that's why mobile games feel like mobile games even if you play them on PC, right? Because they have all of these layers of retention that's typically standard for uh, mobile gaming and they're just really adapting it into uh, console or PC um, and it doesn't always translate well right uh, next up is don't forget to consider your screen size your button size touch points uh, and all of the many different interactions that are specific and exclusive to mobile uh, especially when you're trying to design something that is mobile native we also want to be able to identify the design and identify and design what the screen you're working on is for, the purpose, the objectives, and what you want the player to be able to do on it and have that as a, uh, a sheet or a uh, document that you can share around. Be sure to prioritize readability and usability, especially when considering typography. Uh, and don't forget about localization because mobile gaming at its very core is all about accessibility. I want to play now. So I'll just whip out my phone and play it. That accessibility mindset also applies when you're considering putting out a game for the global market. When The moment you put your game on the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store, uh, it, it is already going to be accessible to way more people that you might have considered. So from the very beginning, Having localization in mind, at least at the wireframe level, so that you can expand into it later on when you have the time and the budget, is ideal. So you don't have to go back, scramble your wireframes. Oh no, we have to localize for Russia. We have to remap all of the screens because it can't fit, right? So you go back from the very beginning, already think about localization. And this also includes like how short your text strings are, um, making your messaging concise and your microcopy clean. So next up is to give your projects its own uh, visual library or UI toolkits. These will really speed up your wireframe and iterations. There are so many in Figma that are free and open to use that you can uh, like take as a basis or as a fundamental, um, what do you call this? As, as your uh, base form. And then as your project grows or as your project becomes more in-depth, you slowly and steadily customize it even further and take advantage of what Figma has in terms of uh, design tools uh, because it's actually very, very powerful. Next is not really everything is important. Consider what the screen is for and what the player wants to do and eliminate everything else. Uh, strongly consider what platforms you are designing for. Don't blindly just reuse everything. Uh, a lot of the interactions might require mouse overs, for example, uh, or on hover tooltip notifications. We don't have that on mobile. Uh, and 
of course, remember, don't over-polish your wireframes. Start with low fidelity and do the polishes for mock-ups when you're done iterating. So, to wrap up that little uh, blitz of a talk, uh, here are some references that I highly recommend from books to YouTube channels to Twitter or X, depending on where you stand in that camp. Um, and even really TikTok has some really quick resources that you can help consider. So I'll stay here a little bit uh, so that you guys can uh, take note of it if ever you'd want to. Uh, the gamer's brain focuses more on the research and analysis of how players play, why they play. Uh, so it's a lot of psychology. Um, Don't Make Me Think uh, is a revis revisited book of designing fo uh, interfaces. Uh, by Steve Krug, uh, Krug. Uh, 100 Things, 100 Things uh, Every Designer Needs to Know About People is uh, also a really good visual read uh, to be able to get into the mindset of, okay, people, something, this thing is designed this way because people use it in a certain way. And that mindset is something that's very, very transferable. Uh, for YouTube, Game Makers Toolkit, Downward Thrust, and Daryl Talks Games, these are all long form video essay type so if you're like me that you know just you just put a video on while you wash the dishes and you just kind of like attempt to passively ingest information about news or current uh happenings in the gaming scene or player psychology or why games feel like the way they do uh these are very good uh, resources on twitter you have St uh, steve bromley is a is the pioneer of uh, user testing in games, uh, of course, there's UXPH, uh, TikTok, uh, Designer Tom makes really good shorts that compare feature A and feature B, which one would you use and when and why. Uh, they're really good, really fast content for like, okay, you're stuck. Where do we put the close button, left or right? Like he has those kinds of like really fast, really quick um, tips. Uh, and heymia.com Sometimes she creates long form ish content of reviewing people's UX portfolios. Also found that to be very good, uh, especially when if you are if you are finding yourself in the middle of things, trying to transition into UX design, figuring out what high people that are hiring UX designers for are looking for is going to help you a lot in creating that uh, resume. For websites, we have dimensions.com, which, which covers both physical and digital dimensions. Specifically, it's very useful for mobile UX design because it also covers pixel width and height of different screens. Uh, Graham McAllister is a writer that made an online book. It's free for everyone to check uh, that features usability playtesting, which is actually very informative. And lastly, UX heuristics is like this great overarching resource that covers multiple different websites that really focus on UX heuristics and principles. So with that, thank you so much for uh, listening. Once again, I'm Tofi from, from Secret 6 and it was really great to be invited to talk about game UX design here. Uh, big ups to UXPH. Uh, I'm Tofi on pretty much every social media platform out there. Uh, and we can open up the floor to a little bit of q and I think, or are we going into our next speaker oh, thank you Toffrey. Toffrey. so guys follow Toffrey on all the social balik mo muna the social social links so, uh, <laughs> there you go lahat ng ano mo ng links mo Toffrey. Toffrey. yes Toffrey, Toffrey tayo all right do you have any questions from the group from the audience uh ayan mira na uh, uh, mira on, hello Christopher how do you choose your type typography for game design and how do you test it all right so that's a good question no? how do yeah you it's very good actually in typography and then how do you actually test it yeah uh so first off for typography uh you want to be able to start off with something that's thematic to the thing that you're developing um so on our end we have mood boards wherein we put pegs of the thing that before even before we design it we have a vision aligned with the game designers uh, and this vision is generated alongside game designers and UX designers. And from this, from these pegs, may you, you, it is already, uh, it is already derivable what kind of typography you want. Uh, and then in terms of testing, uh, there are multiple ways to do it. Um, 
first off, there are websites online. You can actually search for like contrast checkers. You can search for readability tests and you can just put in an image and it'll tell you. Uh, I, I believe that some of these are also AI um, powered. Uh, something that uh, Ellie, you might be very familiar with. Um, <laughs> so the key here is in the very start of the design phase, you want to focus on readability and um, string length uh, or character length. And then from there, move into typography that fits into those, those lengths because it's a lot harder to rewrite your stuff when your typography uh when, when you put into when you put typography first and you make something really nice and fancy and then you find out after writing your microcopy oh shoot it's too long <laughs> because the the spacing of this typography is bad right so focus first on readability accessibility you can have those tested online and you can just upload it uh and check for details there All right uh, I hope that answered the question. Since some native non-gaming apps adjust text size depending on the accessibility settings on iOS, should game apps offer this option as well? Accessibility. So some since non-gaming apps adjust text size, should you do you offer that? Uh, just um, text size. The common practice actually is it is based off the the resolution that is being used by the native uh, OS. It's very easy to apply for non-game applications because these applications are usually, um, what do you call this? They're native to, let's say the example was iOS, right? It's native to iOS. They're native to Android. These are baked or hard baked into the, the um, operating system itself. But while games can't pull uh, the native settings, some mobile games actually offer sliders that change or increase uh, text size for their games. Uh, it's actually being, it, it can be done. Uh, it's very seldomly uh, done actually, uh, but it can be, uh, but it's much more it, it, it is actually much more usable to just make sure uh, from the very beginning that you keep things short, keep things simple so that uh, you can make them as big as you as they have to be. Um, because it really, the, the variety of the mobile space makes these kinds of settings very difficult to manage. Uh, so while yes, best practice is indeed, it's good to be able to provide that option. Uh, but you shouldn't force yourself uh, to apply it. All right, thanks. And then we have, I'll, I'll do three more questions, then let's jump to Pat quickly, and then later on, let's, let's, uh, let's do Q&A with you and Pat, okay? Oh, sure. So three more questions. Uh, the next question is, Hi, Tofi, would you say that using archetypes are the same as using user personas? I wouldn't say they're the same, because archetypes are what you call very generalist. Archetypes are like the it's it's when we stereotype people. So I'll I'll use that word. It's when we stereotype certain people that play certain things. They at the end of the day, are, the archetypes are your tool to identify which aspects or which parts of that archetype resonate with your game that you're trying to design and you're trying to develop. And it's about you inserting multiple aspects of different pers of different archetypes into your persona that you are designing for that makes your persona more realistic uh, and more what do you call this more accurate and you can verify this persona by talking to people that actually play these games so for example if you're play if you're designing a game that's very similar to dark souls you want and you're formulating a persona uh, for this game you want to cross-check your persona with people that actually play Dark Souls. Uh, so you identify the persona and the archetypes. You inject in a little bit of the, the archetypes into your persona to make it accurate. And then you ask people, like, what do you like about X game? What do you, why do you play it so often? And if stuff match between what you're, 
what your intended users are saying and what your persona, what you identified in your persona, then you've made a very good persona. Right. Next. Uh, what's what's next? Uh, which when design? Let me just, uh, yeah. Uh, from Kelsey, uh, when designing for a game project, usually how many designers are there in a team and what are their roles for 2D and 3D? Oh, okay. That actually. Yeah, actually, it's very interesting. Uh, so it goes that goes beyond UX design. Uh, typically, depending the, I would say it depends on the size and the the intensity of the game uh, that is being designed. So the more systems that are needed to make the game function and make the game run, the more designers usually that you'll need. And these designers would usually vary of roles depending on their specializations. So you will have some designers focused on level design. You will have some designers focused on um, figuring out balancing with spreadsheets. You, have, you will have some designers focused on, okay, how do we reward these players? What is the reward scheme like? How do we make feel things feel, uh, how do we make them feel, how do we make them progress through a game with the intended amount of time that we want them to progress through and so on and so forth uh, it can get really granular like granular like that uh there are some sound designers there are some um but at the end of the day like all of these designers need to be able to follow or have an idea of what you're designing and that's where ux design in gaming comes in um ux design doesn't just handle the user ex the, the wireframes and the player flows it also sets up the groundwork for what kind of experience you want to be able to deliver do you want a hard game do you want a difficult game do you want how rewarding do you want the game to be uh what are the kinds of things that would appeal to certain kinds or certain archetypes these are all uh foundational before any other designer comes into play uh, and they would all usually just reference um, one or two centralized documents that talk about that essential uh, core gaming experience. All right. Thanks, Tofer. Uh, one more question, then I'll uh, we'll come back later after after the major. So I have one more question from Lester. Which parts of your work as UX designer for mobile games excite you the most, challenge you the most, or bore you the most? <laughs> uh. In all honesty, what bores me the most is uh, uh, people who approach us asking for to gamify certain things. Uh, it's been done to death. It's something that's very common already. Uh, like they would say, uh, we want this accounting software, but gamify it. Like, okay. <laughs> There's like a checklist that you have to follow. Okay, so this is what it needs to do. This is what usually people expect. This is what will... It, it doesn't really provide a lot of challenge. Uh, gamification in that sense. Um, what excites me the most is the idea that bigger and bigger games are being playable on the go. Like your phone is going to be able... To, it, 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 it was already pretty amazing that phones can play games like COD, Mobile, Fortnite. It's very mind-blowing at times, right? So it's that potential of, okay, we have this IP on this game. Uh, uh, on this platform, we want to bring it to console. What will you do? So, yeah. All right. Uh, thanks, uh, Tofi. I uh, will come back to you later. Uh, Danica and Christian, your questions will come back to you later. For now, let's give some uh, airtime for Pat. Patrick. Uh, it's also, uh, well, Patrick's story is he used to be, a game. <coughs> I know Patrick personally because he, we used to, uh, I introduced him to a couple of uh, 